Okay, so the problem I gave you, we got, I just gave you the theta of t function and ask you several questions. When is theta zero? When is theta maximized or minimized? When is omega zero? When is omega equal to 10? How quickly is omega changing? What's alpha and t? Helps. Different people approach it different ways. Some people just took all three derivatives and got your theta, omega, and alpha functions. And everybody did that, but did that's the first thing you heard. Last thing you did, did it somewhere in the middle. Doesn't matter. You, know, you got the whole problem. And it makes a certain amount of sense to do your derivatives first. So you have three functions. Because then you can answer these questions very easily if you know a little calculus or pre-calculus. Okay. Now, I would use a little bit of pre-calculus on this theta function because it's quadratic. You have a whole theory of quadratic functions that you learn in pre-calculus. Then calculus reinforces it in a way you're going to see in a minute. So First thing, a couple of people graphed it. Now, graphed it using a graphing calculator for a quadratic function. Uh, depends on how much hurry you're in. You should know how to graph without the graphing calculator because you can easily find the vertex and the zeros. Okay. Uh, so, especially if, you, if, if it has real zeros on a vertex, oh, that has to have a vertex. They're easy to find if you know the function. Quadratic equation gives you all the information you need. Okay, now when I wrote this out, the first thing I wrote out was, uh oh, that's what I used. Okay. Um, actually, maybe I got it at zero. Uh, yeah, probably did. Okay. Graph doesn't really look like this. It doesn't have a negative zero. Zeros are right here and here. Okay. Uh, and I used a negative there. I didn't use them finding the vertex that I know better. But anyhow, we find the axis of symmetry. It's the first thing you want to do if you're going to graph the thing. The axis of symmetry is at a to b over 2a. Now, a lot of people memorize that as a second formula. No, you should know the quadratic formula because you use it a lot. And you will use it, so just know it. You're a little rust in your hands. Acceptable, uh, but uh, yeah, you, you should, yeah, everybody should really know it. Okay, the reason the vertex occurs at the axis of symmetry is that a parabola is symmetric, and this graph is a parabola. And I'm just going to say this quickly. Uh, negative b over 2a, is halfway between the zeros because negative b is halfway between negative b plus the square root and negative b minus the square root. Okay, so we know that the zeros have to be distributed symmetrically with respect to the axis of symmetry. And halfway between the zeros is the number here that's halfway divided by 2a, and that's negative b over 2a. Reason that out as you will. But that applies even if you don't have real zeros. You have complex zeros. Okay. Uh, your axis of symmetry is still halfway between. <laughs> still at negative b over 2a. And you don't have to worry about the details of you know, complex zeros. Uh, okay. So, anyhow, that gives you a graph. The graph doesn't quite look like this. Pretend that I never do that. I really don't smart like this. Okay. But the vertex is still here at t equals negative at t equals 10. If my t equals 10, it's real easy. And I, I chose numbers here so you'd have a nice round value of t, so you don't have to do a lot of calculation. You're going to get 0.8 t squared, that's 80. T is 10 minus 160 plus 40. Okay. Unless I'm wrong, it's a 10, negative 40. And that's where you get the zero. Now, there's another way you could have done that. Just using your basic calculus, you find the critical points of this function and test it to see whether it's a maximum or a minimum. I didn't do the test, but you should know that test. You should be able to maximize and minimize a function. So make a note of that. It's real simple. You take the derivative, that tells you where the slope is zero. 
if you're going to have a maximum or a minimum, a relative maximum or a relative minimum, so it has to be zero at that point. Very simple. Okay, so how to remind yourself of that. Because that's something you want to carry with you. You don't want to just remember a formula. You want to remember a reason for the formula. Okay, or a process. So when theta is at a minimum, theta prime equals zero, that's your critical point. Okay, well, theta prime is omega. I already asked you what omega equals zero. You got a t equals 10. I think everybody would have gotten that. Everybody got the right derivative and stuff. That's a really simple equation to solve. Okay? So that confirms what the graph tells you. You don't have to go to graph, but some of you did. And it's real helpful to look at that graph. It helps you visualize what's happening in time. So you got two things moving with respect to different functions. You could like see where the theta curves cross. That's where they both went through the same number of revolutions. Okay. Omega is even easier. You know, if you got two theta functions, when is their velocity? of theta and omega, it just helps guide you to your solution because your theta graphs will tend, maybe they never intersect, okay? You know, maybe they're like this and a wider one like this, it's all the way below narrow, okay? That can happen, okay? That would mean they never have the same Number of revolutions, radians, whatever your units are. Okay. Uh, and really, what I'm telling you here is pretty much all of the chapter on uniform acceleration. I'll have to make that connection in a minute. Um, so, we understand that we can answer all kinds of questions about velocities and positions. If we know the theta function. Okay. Now, if we know the omega function and the initial position, we can get the theta function. Okay. If we know the alpha function and the initial omega and the initial theta, we did this before, and you know, we did this last week. Uh, we can find the omega and theta functions, and then we're off to the races. Okay, all that makes sense. So if it is, if it doesn't, you know, listen to my words of wisdom here. Figure out how you would have set up much better. Okay, there's a better way to say it. Nobody's ever discovered it, but you can. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So. Uh, that's a framework for solving uniform acceleration problems. Now, I want to make a connection because you're not going to see omegas and thetas and alphas until sometime in later October. Okay. What you're going to see is x's and v's and a's. Well, here's your framework. Framework we've been using here. Okay. Can we understand all the connections? Because y'all did the calculus and this really well. There's another one. Okay, so is there, you see any similarity? It's exactly the same. You just rename these things, X and 
B and A, X is your position along a straight line. Okay. And very quickly, we get to the point where we have an X and a Y. Okay. So you know, another part of the framework is you can say Gonna be BDT here. If we saw that and be too polite and correct me. Be sure to correct me. Jump up and down up almost the thing, and you can go on the screen and tell me what I did wrong. Okay. So why would I put a VX and an AX and all this here? Because sometimes you want motion in two dimensions, like a golf ball. Okay. So then you would have Have this. Okay. This is okay. one dimensional motion. This is two dimensional motion. If acceleration is uniform, then you're never dealing with anything more than a quadratic function. You know, your position function will be quadratic because if acceleration is uniform, that means A is constant. So when you integrate it, you get a multiple of T plus an initial value, okay? And then you integrate that, you get a multiple of T squared plus the product of the initial value you got down here with t and the, the initial value of this over there and it's all very straightforward you can understand that from what i just said you should kind of recognize it if you understand i'm going to talk fast okay there's a framework chapters one and two right there's three and four two and three two of those chapters Okay. Now it'll be a couple of weeks before we work through all the details of those chapters. I've gone ahead and done the assignments for chapters one and two, and I think maybe chapter three. It's a little complicated, clerically, because of the fact that we had a week delay in posting these. And we've done something a little different here, and I've got to figure out how to compress the workforce. So 13 weeks instead of 14 years. Okay, 12 and a half. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Anyhow, mathematically, it's all pretty simple because you'll have a pretty good command of your calculus. Okay. Uh, intuitively, it's a little more complicated. So let me just talk a little bit about what happens um, with straight line motion as opposed to rotation motion. Okay. When it is super full, this means two. So if I start this thing here,
Looks like it moves along there at a pretty constant velocity, right? So if, if X is its position here, what can you tell me about the X of T function? And I'll stop here. So there's more. some moving along here. It looks like it's not speeding up or slowing down. Looks like we've kind of got a constant velocity here or something pretty close to constant velocity. Okay, so need to be asked because this is one dimension. Now, when I toss this ball to you, and you better catch it because pitch in the face is going to hurt. Um, if I toss this off, throw the ball to you. Okay. But maybe not because you missed this bears. You toss one to me because I never lose. Okay. If V is equal to V naught, What's A of T? What's X of T? Give me a minute to digest that and work it out. Okay, so I had a question. Is V not uh, motion? Well, if this is in constant motion, it looks to me like, let's say, 1001, 1002, 1004, 1005, about five seconds. And that's a little less than a foot. This is a foot long. Okay, it's about 11. Inches roughly in five seconds. This is that one 10 inches. So we'll move to two inches per second. Well, that would be 5.08 centimeters per second. So just say five centimeters per second, which is 0.05 meters per second, right? So we're in units of distance per second when we're measuring velocities, as opposed to radians per second or revolutions per second or degrees per second if we're measuring something that's rotating, okay? So there's one analogy. So, you know, you could say, you know, you can work this out if you want, not even symbolically. You can go ahead and use five centimeters per second for V naught if you want. But then you can just replace whatever that leads to with V naught and get the symbol, okay? Okay, so they said, well, if V is constant, is acceleration zero? I said, well, does that follow from these? Points? Well, it's pretty obvious that it does. Acceleration is dV dt, and if V is constant, root of a constant is zero. V isn't changing. So its rate of change is zero, and the derivative is the rate of change. Okay, what about the X? Okay, so I asked him, well, it is constant. What's this say about x? Well, it says that dx dt equals v naught, right? And how do you get x from this if you know v? The question is, would you integrate? Bingo, yes, exactly. So you just do antiderivative of your x function, your v function, and see what you get. Okay, now we're making good progress, but of course, trying to connect the mathematics with the reality is confusing enough. And it's, I think, causing, causing some of you to lose track of the calculus, okay? But you have it all. Okay, first place, you know, we have the suggestion is X not linear. You don't guess X is linear. How do you prove that?
B of T equals dx dt equals B naught. dx dt equals B naught implies that x is an derivative of V naught with respect to T. And I grew to be not with respect to T is B not T plus an integration constant. The integration constant Integration constant is whatever x is when t equals zero. All the constant x naught, so There it is. That's the equation of motion. And everything you need is in that equation of motion to answer any question about the position point or about the motion. If I ask you, okay, what's the velocity of t equals 12? Well, the velocity is always equal to v naught. Okay. So if I could let x naught equal zero, but it's not all that informative, okay? It's a special case. So let's say x naught is Twenty-five centimeters. Okay. What would the position be? Zero. Then I'll add two more questions here. When would it should be zero? When would it be negative ten centimeters? When would it be fifty centimeters? Right, it got kind of small there, but it should be easily visible on the screen. Okay, so I've given you this information. We know that x of t is v naught t plus x naught. And that comes from very simple derivation if we understand the derivative and integral relationships, which are very simple and we're used to. Okay, so we can easily derive this formula rather than memorizing it. And we want to be able to do that. Plenty of stuff you need to memorize. Process, I think, here is important about. Okay, so we write, okay, x of t equals v naught t plus x naught. v naught is five centimeters per second. x naught is 25 centimeters. Okay. So we write out the equation. This is the equation we need to answer any question we might have about x, our position. 
And all these questions are about positions. Okay. So Big function, all we need. Okay, so I'm not going to write all the words for us because it should be pretty obvious. I think that's what we're going to do. And if you didn't do it here, you did it on previous question. Okay, x of t equals zero. That's solution of that equation tells you one position is zero, right? So if you write that out in a little more detail. And I brought up in symbol. Three dots means there are a couple of steps there. You subtract the X naught from both sides. Divide by B naught, and there it is, okay? So that's where I'm saying. Right there's the function, okay? Uh, X naught is 25 centimeters over. Five centimeters per second. And that equals negative five seconds. Now, how does that happen? How do we get a negative time? Well, by writing B naught equals five centimeters per second. This motion that means this direction has to be positive. You use right for being positive, but leftward can be positive. Okay, so when we set this up, if we wanted to make right positive, we could have said B naught is negative five centimeters per second, right? That would have been a different motion. That would have been okay, so. This thing was already at 25 centimeters and it's moving in the positive direction. It ain't never going to be zero if it started from here. Our solution is negative five seconds. Now, what this says is that, well, at negative five seconds, something that was actually moving along in some earlier time was here at t equals zero. Think out here by t equals. Something's moving along here, and was here at t equals negative five seconds, took it a while to get to t equals zero. Okay. So t equals negative five seconds could be a valid solution. In other words, for an equation or for a system where something has already been moving, but we choose our to start our time somewhere in the middle. Okay. Like if I throw this at you, okay, it takes a couple seconds to get there, okay? It's between one and two seconds. And we want to start analyzing it from the peak. Well, it was still moving before the peak. So if the peak is t equals zero, then this is like negative 0.8 seconds or whatever. And when you catch it, it's maybe positive 0.8 seconds. Okay, that makes sense. So you can get negative results and then you kind of need to know how to interpret. Um, a lot of times you try to set things up so you don't get negative results, but sometimes you're kind of stuck with it. Like maybe something's been moving since the beginning of time, whenever that was. I barely remember. Okay. 
Okay, so this is the procedure. And then to answer the other questions, when is the position zero? Well, we answered that one's a position negative 10 centimeters. But it's already moving. Negative 10 centimeters, that'll occur about here. I said that's maybe a negative two seconds, and maybe that's it because the numbers are easy. Let's see. Okay. We already know that C is negative X naught over B naught, right? So if we'd solved this symbolically, we'd already know what the solution is going to be. We wouldn't have had to solve it with the numbers. Now, sometimes, and I think more often than the authors do, or whoever set up them, Here's some materials, most authors. Uh, I think it's sometimes important to solve the equation with the actual numbers because it causes you to think about it in a slightly different way. So you'll see me do both. Right now, right here's your standard way of solving. Symbolically, think about what it means. It gives you negative of negative 10 centimeters. At negative two seconds, two seconds before it reached your x equals zero point. Then, what is the position 50 centimeters? Well, you can do that. You take the uh, You know what I did just didn't make any sense at all. I try to make the point about solving these things. Let me do this again. So that was really kind of stupid. It gave me something that actually made sense. But not really. Okay, so let's do it again. You got V naught T. I'm going to call this X. Let's call this X sub L. Okay. Now, this is a solution for any X. This was a solution that relied on X equals zero. So it was kind of, uh, that wasn't, wasn't very good for me to do. Anyhow, you solve this equation. Well, it's easy. It's XF minus X naught over B naught, right? And that's going to be your final position. Well, in this case, your final position would be negative 10 centimeters minus X naught, which is 25 centimeters. And XF is 10 centimeters, not negative 10 centimeters. Okay, so this comes out 15 over 5. This comes out 3 seconds. Anything about the details of the arithmetic. Okay, so I apologize for going that thing I did down here. I don't, was not solving the general case. That didn't work. I was oversimplified. Okay, anyhow, we understand how to use these equations. Your equation is for any x out x of t equals x out uh, I translate this equation as just x of t equals x out so everything's in symbols. 
And I've got a symbolic solution to the equation in terms of whatever XF you want to put in here, right? And we can then solve for T. And we can put 50 centimeters in here. Um, we get 50 centimeters minus 25 centimeters. Yes, no. Okay. Okay. Let me bring three seconds. Okay. So you can plug the numbers in. Okay. It's all very simple. I was going to talk about vectors today, but let's just finish developing this. Okay. And I'm just going to kind of tell you the way it goes at this point, because I think. We have enough data what we're doing. So, the phase constant of B is A T plus B naught. I can just write V equals the integral of A D T, which is A T plus V naught. Where we understand that V naught is T equals zero value. Let me talk about why that works. And then X. Is this. I won't write out the corresponding integral, we're just integrating this integration constant with BRT equals zero value of X. That's it, those are equations for uniformly accelerated motion. And so you can solve. You just solve any uniformly accelerated motion given enough information. Now things get a little bit complicated when you have to solve certain sets of simultaneous equations. Um, probably not going to talk about that today. But as an example, Our standard SI unit is meters per second squared. You'll see that in the first assignment in the Pearson. I think I've got that one too. Okay. okay. Probably Friday late. So you don't necessarily have that done before the lab. That makes sense. Okay. Because we kind of understand it already. Okay, so the standard unit is a meter. Uh, So you got negative two meters per second squared, initial velocity of five meters per second, x naught equal to zero. Um,
What is x equal to three meters? Let's start with that question. I'll probably throw in another question or two. The very first thing I would do solving this problem is write out my two functions. Okay. Once you write out the two functions, then you want to find when x is three meters. You don't want to write out what you think is the equation with the three meters in it, okay? Until you have this, so you can focus on this, keep yourself focused. So you can just write, okay, well, what is x equal to three meters? Well, x of t equals three. Now we're gonna understand that we have meters per second squared here and meters per second here and meters here. But usually I'm gonna write out the units and want you to do that, okay? Right now, just look what we got. Got x of t equals three, right? That's an easy equation to solve, okay? You know, it's negative two. Here, and then, and of course, if you have a software product equations in the line, this is really easy how to get used to. You gotta have the quadratic expression equal to zero, and then you use the quadratic formula, right? And then you get Values of t. Okay. Plug those into your v of t function if you want to find the velocity when x equals zero or when x equals three meters. Okay, so you solve for t and you do this. Now, having done that, you motion is uniform, and most of what the chapter. Chapter two is going to be long, and whatever chapter two isn't even assigned until sometime next week. Got these two equations. Now, these can be regarded as simultaneous equations, and for reasons that hopefully we'll see in the next four minutes, it can be very useful to eliminate a variable between these equations. Okay. First equation gives you t equals v minus v naught over x. It's called to you know, subtract v naught from both sides and divide by a. Substitute this expression for t, and we get this.
Bill Miller, if you take, you're going to be squaring the A down here. You have an A here, so you're going to end up with an A in the denominator. You got a one half here, so you got a two in the denominator. And use obscure law square B minus B naught. And that's a little rusty. It's not this uh, Then you get You might note at this point, you got a BB naught here and a 2BB naught here. They're both over A. And this two is over two. So here you've got a negative BB naught and here you got a plus BB naught and it goes away. Okay. So, we could write this out in more detail, but we're almost out of time. Uh, so if you look at this and this, if you write these out one term at a time, and simplify the BV notch. Go away, don't tell you anymore. So we get B squared over 2A, plus B not squared over 2A. Minus B naught squared over A plus X naught. Both of these are over 2A. So I'm going to put a 2 here and a 2 here. So we have a common denominator. And now we have X minus X naught equals negative B naught squared. B naught squared minus two B naught squared and that B naught squared B squared plus B naught squared over two A. So lots of ways I can choose to rearrange this, but it's just simple. It's algebra two. Okay, it's a little bit tricky, but it's not bad. You're rusting, you know. Quite similar to that, or what it is, it isn't bad. Uh, actually, I want to practice. Differently. B squared minus B naught squared is this. Notice there's no T in here. And you could use this equation instead of solving the quadratic formula to find T and then plugging it in. If all you wanted to do is find B, then X equals three, cent, three meters. Because B naught was, what was it? Five meters per second, you had your acceleration. Okay, so you have B naught, you had your acceleration. Well, you have B naught, you had your acceleration, and you had your X naught, and you were given the value of X that you want, right? So you just plug those numbers in here, and the only thing that you don't have a number for is B. That cuts the solution of this problem down considerably. So this is going to be one of the four equations that we use for uniformly accelerated motion. It's a pretty important equation. After we get Newton's second law, the next thing that pops out of this is definition of kinetic energy. Okay? Just pops out immediately. If you let A equal net force over mass, which is what Newton's second law says, you get a definition of kinetic energy. We're not going to do that today. All this stuff hangs together in a way that makes a whole lot of sense out of the universe, okay? Sometimes you gotta get by a little bit of mathematics. And if you haven't been using a lot of it recently, uh, even if you have, you know, about trivial manipulations. 
not really going to ask you to do these manipulations. We have to understand that this equation comes out. I might, you know, might ask. Okay. You have to understand this equation comes out just from eliminating t between these two equations. Solve the first one for t, plug that into the second one, do a little arithmetic, algebra, and then go up pop something very, very useful. And there's a fourth equation. There are going to be four equations. This is one, this is one. Well, this is one, this is one, this is one, and there's one other that we'll take a quick look at. I'll try to, it's easier to get to these two. 